Latrice, Perfect. tell us about yourself uh, and what would you like for your readers to know about you? Mm, I would just say that definitely I'm a servant. It's something that I absolutely love to do. I'm a mother, a grandmother. Um, and I just feel like the Lord has definitely blessed me. Um, he's actually spoken to me that I'm an encourager. So there's no way for me to turn it off. That's who I am. That's what I love to do. And I feel like that's the purpose that I was created for. And you've written another book that we've done before, Wounded. Could you tell us a, a, a little bit about that? And then we'll talk about the book that brings us here today. Absolutely. Um, Wounded was written, I believe, in 2017. Um, it's about a young girl that was being abused at home and bullied in school. Um, these are topics that are very real. They're prominent. Um, there are a lot of things that are happening here in the world that a lot of times the best thing that we feel we can do is just to ignore it and pray that it goes away. Um, so I feel like the Lord has blessed me to be a voice, to just be able to bless others and just create an awareness that's not just going to make us talk, it's going to make us behave and act differently. In the word, it always tells us that we are indeed to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So I just want to motivate and encourage people to do just that. Sometimes it causes us to have to speak when someone else feels like they don't have a voice. Yes. Um, and tell us the backdrop of the book um, that we're here today about abuse. Okay. Abuse No More, The Breaking of a Mindset. Um, that is my personal story. That's my um, autobiography that was written. And I didn't write it to create a woe is me. I wrote it to actually be able to bless others to know that they're not alone. And right in the midst of all that we go through, the Holy Spirit is still there. He protects us. He guides us. And he came so we can have a life more abundantly. So I just want to encourage people to know that even though we go through hardships, God is still in the midst. And as long as you just continue to look above it, you will be able to rise above it as long as you seek ye first the kingdom of God. You open this book up with letting us know something that someone would dare to tell you, mm -hmm. very transparent. You told us about you were three years old. Yes, ma'am. You were penetrated, full-fledged sex. And now yes, that you are an, an adult, you said mm -hmm. in your book that uh, you see innocence planted on the battlefield, wandering in and out of the enemy's camp. And you, I, I call it three components that you told us, unarmed, unprepared, and yes, unprotected. Protected. Could you tell us in, in those three components, when you say unarmed, and now that you're mm. an adult, so tell us, what does that look like, being that you know that you was that child, mm. and that you said innocence is on a battlefield. Yes, ma'am. Um, a lot of us are on the battlefield a lot of times and we're not even aware of it. A lot of times, even when we go into prayer, prayer we're not really prepared to fight the battle. Um, so unarmed means there was no way that I could have protected myself. And for a lot of times people walk around, they feel shame, they feel buried, they feel incomplete, but yet and still God is there. So um, arm means I didn't know how to defend or protect myself. And you said unprepared. Of course, you were three years old. And exactly. Just to say unprepared. Absolutely. And so unprepared is a lot of times um, we could have uncomfortable conversations to prepare somebody to know that any time at all, we can go under attack. There were no words. There was no preparation. There was no conversation to be able to help you to get geared up, especially at such a young age, to be able to fight those battles or to know even though this has happened, it doesn't happen again. Allow me to open up our mouth because we have to realize that there is power in our tongue. So even if I knew about this, maybe I could have spoke out against it or I could have made someone aware that could have came in and protected me. You mentioned unprotected. When you look at that, I think about a mother, a mother who, I don't know if we, I'm a mother myself. I have four children. I don't know. I know we think as young girls, you know, you want to make, make sure that your, your daughter is not um, molested in any kind of way, sitting on some mm. lap or uncle lap or, or any male lap. I know we try to 
you know, protect them there. But what about the unseen, unprotected that we don't think about? Now that you're an adult and you can tell us as adult, being that you were there, what, mm -hmm. how can we protect uh, that innocent child from something like that, especially if there's no voice to tell? Absolutely. Um, I would say that we want to make sure that we're vigilant at all times. It's something that we're constantly reminded of in the Bible, that we have to be vigilant. And it's not enough for us to see and be aware. We have to be able and willing to step in to protect those that cannot protect themselves. So not only should we be having those type of conversations, but not only that, we shouldn't be ignoring signs or even covering them up. Also, in mentioning that, um, there's somewhere in your book where you see that a person that has, I don't know if we, I don't know if we should say molested. Some people say molested. And I don't know if we should say at three that you're consented. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, ma'am. So how do you, um, as you can remember in your mind, how do you, without feeling guilty, because you must have felt a lot of guilt to mm. not tell when we're told, well, maybe someone, maybe you wanted it. You can't say that to the little kid, you know, the, the teenager right. the age group. Maybe you wanted, what did you put on? What did you wear? And so mm. how can we think about at that age? We not thinking that they're mm. putting on something or warranted something at that age. Thank you, Lord. Um, definitely. So as I look back, I used to always feel cursed because of these things. And there was guilt that I carried from a young age, knowing that this continued to happen to younger family members. You always wish, you always hope, you always pray that you could be able to do something different so it didn't have to carry on and go on to someone else. And those type of things, they don't just go away. They seem to cling to you and you feel like you have a doubt, a dark cloud because you're carrying a weight that doesn't even belong to you. Um, so what I just want to do is um, take the time out just to speak to the children out there and let you know that you are important, that your safety matters, and that at any time, whether it be a teacher, um, it's a friend, speak up and speak out because you don't want to carry that weight that doesn't have your name on it into your into life, into your next relationships, into the places where you go. And so a lot of times I talk about the things, it's not about what people call you, it's what you answer to. And so, so many of us are still blocked, we're hindered, we're not able to grow, we walk around with these spiritual cages that no one else can see, but we're still answering to that name of molested or abused. Um, and once again, this, this, this translates not only into abuse, it, it also deals with other people dealing with trauma. So I just wanna encourage you, if you wouldn't answer to molested, if someone said, hey, molested, stand up, if that's not you, then you have to be, you have to be careful of the conversation that you have, the company that you keep, and you wanna just continue to keep a praise of our Lord on your lips. Because as long as we continue to look up, we can see him, we can see his fingerprints. We don't have to walk around scarred and damaged. We have freedom and that comes from Jesus. Hey, man, you said also that you identify yourself as broken beyond repair. Why yes, did you title yourself as such? Um, that was the thing that I was answering to without even knowing it. Um, when I look back at the relationships, when I look back at the places I would go, when I would look back at the things that I would accept, I was scarred. I was damaged. At one point when I was younger, I was suicidal because I felt as though there was no reason for me to be here. When you begin to hate everything that you are, you begin to manifest that in everything that you do. Um, so with that being said, as I'm writing a book, I allow the Holy Spirit to do a, a precious and a magnificent work. There was times where I felt like I was naked or I was exposing myself, but then I had to realize that it's not really about me. It's all about being able to help someone get free before I was able to. Yes. Uh, we often think of young men not having fathers in their life. How important is it for young ladies to have fathers in their lives? 
Oh my goodness. That is so powerful. Um, you know, just in reading the Bible, a lot of times I look back and sometimes before they even give a word, they give the genealogy, they give the history behind where this person came, this person begot this person that begot this person. When you don't have that, and that's a missing link, a lot of times we don't know who we are. And when you don't have a father figure, you tend to cling to people and you look for them to be the way out. So no matter what happens, always know that you do have a father that is sitting in heaven that knows about you and is the lover of your soul. But just like it creates um, empty, dry, broken places in men, it also affects women. If we're looking at our, our father that was not there, a lot of times we have people that say they're there, but they're missing also, and we're not even aware of it. You mentioned in your book about victims, they become sometimes uh, victimizers. Tell us about mm -hmm. that. Oh my gosh. It's just like that figure eight, that infinity symbol. You don't know where it stops or where it ends. And so a lot of times those that have been abused, that have been molested, that have been raped, um, something in, in our genes, something about it allows us to take that opposite role where we actually become the victim becomes the victimizer. And I actually had that. And so sometimes we think that it stops on a level of what was done to me, I do to other people. But sometimes we can be sabotaging and taking that into other relationships and also cause a brokenness that happens there. So not only are we doing exactly what was done to us, sometimes those things linger and they affect different um, relationships that we're involved in. You bring me right to where we want to be right now as an adult. Um, was it hard to have relationships? And I mean, when did you consider, um, okay, I'm in a relationship, this is an attack, especially when it comes to mm -hmm. intimacy. How did you, you know, separate the two from I'm in a relationship and, 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 and this is what we're doing versus some type of trauma that comes back to you? Absolutely. I said that um, that process was already damaged. You begin to struggle with what's acceptable, what's real, um, and then even just not really knowing who you are. And so what happens is either people shut down and they're not able to be intimate or they are overly intimate with everyone. Mm. Um, so with that being said, I never struggled in a relationship with loving people. Even in broken people, I can see greatness because I actually believe that the Bible is a literal thing that applies to me. So even when I see something that's dark, when I see something that's ruined, if I feel like I'm being led to that, I come in with the belief that whatever I can't do, the Lord can do it. But then you have to realize that the other person has to be um, open to that as well what would you say to um yourself i know that they always say that inner small woman um read from reading your book it made me think about that what would you say about yourself as an adult because in your book, I'm, I'm giving you like two frames of what I see from your book and what you are now representing yourself as a, a woman. In your book, it's like, I'm a victim, but I'm crying out for you. This doesn't have to be something that you carry through your life. It's like a, a wounded person who is really not looked at as the, the victor but the victim, but the strength that was in the book, it was showing, hey, that this victim was a victorious um, person who cried out for those who to not hide the pain, to show your wounds on this battlefield and mm -hmm. to keep it moving. So tell us about that. It would you mm -hmm. could say to yourself mm -hmm. and looking back, because you were certainly victorious talking in this book. Oh, wow. That's so powerful, Ellen. I want to thank you for that. Um, but just even looking back, a lot of times I sit back and I wish this would have been different. I wish this would have happened, but I'm thankful 
because I believe that it's not just about me. It's just showing who God is and just giving him the glory because I truly believe that all things that were meant for my bad have already turned around. And I just want to say that for a long time, I struggled. Like if somebody said, oh, you're beautiful, you're attractive. The first thing I would think is, oh, they can see my insides. I know there was something different in me that would radiate outwards. They couldn't see me because I couldn't see me. Um, but I'm just thankful, but I wish that long ago, I didn't start love, loving myself until I was 31. What if I would have had the love? What if I would have had the love of Jesus poured out, you know, at a sooner age, but then that would just change everything about me. And I'm thankful that I feel like no matter what atmosphere I go in, the Lord can use me. And I'm thankful that certain situations happen that way. It keeps you humble. Mm -hmm. So that way, when the Lord elevates you or, or he uses, you know, that you're blessed, but it's not about you and your glory is truly about radiating and showing who he is. And so today I was like, okay, um, I want to be able to show something a little different than I have before. And so I even picked out something to read that no matter what darkness we face, the light is still shining. You have to determine that you're not going to hide it. You know, you have to share it, not just with people that look, act, and think like you. You have to share it with your city. You have to share it with the world because that's why the Lord put it in you. Mm -hmm. And so even if that's okay, um, Ellen, would it be okay if I actually read something from out of the book on page 70? Yes. Um, and it's just talking about darkness. And so um, I'll start in the second um, paragraph. It says, like a flower we must first be potted, which is to be placed to the point of being held down in nutrient rich soil. In terms of defining the richness of the soil, one must equate that the darkness or the appearance of what has surrounded us as the plant, the better. The darkness that we have been planted in, A, it promotes growth and will B, inevitably lead to the light if we believe and seek ye first the kingdom of God, which is Matthew 6 and 33. The darker your situation appears to be, the greater potential you will possess. And that's period. So a lot of times people feel like they're surrounded by, they're enveloped in darkness, but that doesn't have to stop you. That can be a starting point for you to be able to change and transition into the next level, because we know that God's grace and mercy renews each and every day. And so just yeah. to continue on, it says we have to be placed in the perfect atmosphere. Now that atmosphere is going to look different to each and every person, but that will prom promote our personal and spiritual growth. We are then water, which transports, which transports the proper nutrients throughout the plant, the cells and the roots as well to help us to be able to stand. A lot of times people feel like when they're under attack, they got to come out swinging. But we know that our weapons are not carnal. We know that we can't react just like the world. And sometimes people think just to be silent is to show weakness. But I encourage you, no matter what you go through, you must stand. That is an active position. That's where the Lord can actually use you. And when you stand, you can't be easily crumbled. You can't be flexing from one point to the next. Sometimes we just have to stand. And when we're we're standing and we're steadfast in the Lord. He comes and he fights the battle. So that's what I want to do is just encourage you, no matter what's going on, remember that we have to continue to pray without ceasing. That's the only way to just castrate every darkness that you face. Yeah. <laughs> you you have a daughter. You have a yes, son. You have what, two children? Yes, I do. Yes, ma'am. I have a daughter and I have a son. So is your daughter older or your son my son is older my daughter is 24 my son's 26 and the reason why I wanted to ask you did you tell them your story did you tell them when you were younger this will happen I know sometimes as an adult I'll just use myself I may not tell them every part of my life mm. but yet I'm their mother absolutely and so just to answer that question, absolutely I did. I didn't want them to be unarmed or unpre unprepared or unprotected. I wanted to be able to have real and kingdom conversations. That way they're not blindsided by the attack of the enemy. Hey, man. We have some people out here saying hello. Uh, I see Liz is here. 
Oh, that's and, supernova. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's Clovis. Yes. Hello, Clovis and Regina. And if you guys have any questions, just come right on in. That So was it hard to have that conversation? You waited till they got in a certain age or mm. when you say it's time to talk about my story? Right. I, as far as I know, I've been talking from the very beginning. And so sometimes the enemy will try and defeat you and make you feel like you tell too much. And so sometimes I even struggle, Lord, why did I say that? That makes me look special. It makes me look slow. Or, you know, maybe they're not prepared for that. But a lot of times the Lord will move on my heart and he makes you say those things that are uncomfortable in order to be able to help to protect someone or, or give them encouragement or allow them to be in the know so that way they know how to uh, move. And so something that was something I kind of wrestled with. But I know for a fact that that's how the Lord created to be me to be. He continues to just, have me open my mouth and say things sometimes I really wouldn't, I wouldn't choose to say. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in your mind, about what age would you say your son and your daughter was? Um, I started talking I to them. Remember them knowing. Right. I want to say I started talking to them very young. Mm -hmm. um, and then as they got older, then I can give a little bit more detail, yeah. hoping that that will open a door where if, you know, God forbid something would happen to them, they would feel comfortable enough to come back and talk to me about it. Did your son feel protective as a male? And did your daughters feel like, oh, mommy, wow. Mm. You no, know, we have different type of thought process. Absolutely. And then too, um, just because of the situation or that I face, I know it's, this is something not only that crosses racial lines, it crosses gender lines, it crosses um, like our social, um, it just crosses everything. You know, there's so many different people that are impacted. And a lot of times they feel shamed into not saying anything or shamed into believing that this is something that should take place. This they're shamed into believing that you know what this is natural. This is something that happens, and so I definitely wanted to make sure that I opened that door. Um, mm -hmm. As a mother, do I feel like I was the best? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, because you begin to see all of these things unfold in the relationships and the situations you were in. I had my first child at 18, and I thank the Lord for that because up until then, I didn't feel like I had a reason to be here. So my son gave me life. He gave me a reason to be here and cherish each and every moment. And then when I had my daughter, my daughter is so strong. She taught me how to be strong, and I find it very encouraging. It gives me life to know that my daughter, not only is she strong, she's very wise. And so when I look at her, I'm like, wow, if only I was like that. And for her, it was such an early age at my age now. And so they give me strength and they give me life. That's beautiful. Uh, Liz on the board, she said, when and how did you realize how loved you are by God, despite such betrayal by family? Wow. Like, OK, so um, one of the things I was talking about just the other day, I remember when I was in a same sex relationship. And I remember trying to come out. And I, one day I got up and I, I was laying on the floor in my living room. I just made a little pat, um, a little pad and I was just laying there. And my partner came and she laid next to me. And then in the middle of a dream or a vision, I was laying there and the window was above me. All of a sudden that window opened up wide and it, and it spanned from like the ceiling all the way down to the floor. And then in my vision, it was like I saw the Lord's head peek in and was staring at me. And I just began to shiver in my dream. And then I woke up and I was like, praise the Lord, because I didn't have to wake up. What if I didn't have another opportunity to get right? You know, mm -hmm. and then, too, in the dream, I was seeing all this light pouring out on me. Um, there was another situation right around that same time. I'm in my 30s and I went to I used to love to go to the beach in Deerfield Beach. And I used to go um, to the beach in the middle of the night. And at that time, I would just cry out and I would pray unto the Lord. And I remember we had a full moon and I looked up and I saw a rainbow come across it. And so here it is with those two experiences. I know that I was seen. I knew that I was loved. 
I knew that I had another opportunity to get it right. Because even when I failed him, a lot of times we get to the position where we fall. We don't feel like it's an option to get back up. But when Jesus was on a cross and he hung his head and died, three days later, he got back up. And he gives us that same spirit. He gives us that authority and the power when we rest in him. And so I was thankful that even when I failed, even when I thought that I could because I love him so much, how could I ever? Sometimes what happens is we forget that the Lord already knows what, what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when we think it's him that we've broken his heart, a lot of times we've broken our own because we've broken our word and we've broken the trust. But the Lord just continued to show me that he was there in the midst. He loved me. And yes, sometimes it may be embarrassing because other people see your fall, but you still have that ability to get back up. And he loves you just that much that you can, that he's going to be able to strengthen you wherever you're weak. At that point in time, when those things happened, I knew not only was I seen, but he was the lover of my soul. And he gave me another opportunity to get back up. Thank you, that is beautiful to, to just know right then there all that you felt. And I was talking to my daughter today earlier. We can't, we don't, unless you're adopted, and I don't know then how much that goes as far as choosing your family. We don't get mm -hmm. to choose which family we in. We don't get to choose early on uh, when we have uh, our family to protect us, what's going to happen in that family, whether it's a loving family or not, things happen. And just seeing that, I don't want to say that this was your journey to happen in this family. You know what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. Had it been another route, if I had been in another family, what this had happened to me, had you mm. thought about those things of choosing your own family, choosing your own uh, things that would have happened to your life to give you that good start. Mm, absolutely. I would have changed absolutely everything. I would have changed who I was, what I look like, the city I grew up in. I would have chose differently every single time. So as I look back at it now, I'm thankful that I had these situations. If I'm born to be an encourager, how can I encourage someone when I've never experienced hardship? Mm -hmm. That would be hard to do. I, instead of encouraging people, I probably would be judgmental. There's certain things that I can talk about, but it's going to be a little bit differently than someone that's never experienced these things. So I actually turn around and you get, you get excited and you become very thankful that the Lord blessed me and he chose me for a time such as this. This is going to be a, a hard question I ask you. And again, mm -hmm. I told you that there might be something that you just don't know what I'm going to say. And that's good. I love it. Okay. So a moment ago, we talked about, now we both are Christians. We talked about these things. And you mentioned um, that you were in a same-sex relationship. When it comes mm -hmm. to uh, being a Christian yes. and the world knows this, they, they just choose. And yes. this is not to get on in any kind of community or hurt any kind of community. Yes, ma'am. I know that like you said, what you saw in that vision and stuff, some people choose to be in same-sex relationship and they yes. think it's okay. And mm. to, like you choose being heterosexual, you can choose being being uh, gay as well. Yes, yes, yes. And so, or lesbian, whatever the terms is, I try to be mm. very careful with those nouns and pronouns and stuff. Yes, ma'am. And so when you say that you've been there mm -hmm. and, 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 and what happened in your life, and yes. you can talk to someone because they may say, well, you know, I don't want this to change. Why is mm. this? Why is this something that is wrong? And we look of it in a, in the neighborhood of sin. So we're not talking about sin. Yes. Not understanding why. Let's just ask you and uh -huh. being in that relationship. And then um, Donnie McClurkin, he always talk about and this is one thing I said, um, he said he had a sprinkle of male and a sprinkle of female, and he think mm. that he would just live his life, the rest of his duration of his life, uh, without a partner, because mm. he chose not to go either way. In my mind, mm. Ellen saying this is that I believe that he does not want to hurt God in any way. So he thinks mm. about his soul and he thinks about his preparation Thank of meeting, meeting the creator. 
that that mm-hmm. is more important than pleasing his soul, Thank you know, you, pleasing his flesh. So that's the way I look at it. But to mm-hmm. say that you, you're you going to be lonely for the rest of your life and to sit back in the joy of your music, which is fine, but we are made for companionship. So how mm-hmm. do you tell that to someone? Hey, I was in this type of relationship, just like you said, same sex relationship. And they may think it's right. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it's so deep because earlier today, I was talking to a close friend of mine. I was talking to Haley and I was talking about, you know, when you begin to speak on this topic, we have to realize that everything that we do, we must do it in love. That's in, Mm -hmm. um, I believe that's in second Corinthians. And so with that being said, I know for a fact, I heard the Holy Spirit say, I took you as far as I could like this. Now, keep in mind, yes, in the word, it says it's not good for man to be alone, but we have to realize that everybody's journey is a little bit different. When I hear Donnie McClurkin say that, of course, he didn't say it to me personally. I hear, wow, what a huge sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice what I love and what I'm comfortable with and what I would enjoy to be able to serve God. Like there are some people that are created to be by themselves, but that's such a huge, Mm -hmm. a huge responsibility to be able to sacrifice what I consider as being my own personal gain in order to be able to serve the love, like serve the Lord. I feel like there's a greatness that's going to come out of that because that is totally unselfish. That's laying down everything that I would enjoy in order to be able to serve the Lord. Like that's not an easy task. Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking, oh my gosh, first of all, not only that, that protects someone else. What if you get in a relationship because you, everyone is telling you this is the right thing to do. But then again, you're not able to love the other person because you don't have that naturally in it. Yes, the Lord can place it. But when I hear it, I'm just thinking about how great and how awesome that is mm-hmm. to be able to lay down your life, to be able to serve Christ. And so with that being said, I say we have to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So that's going to be our enemies. That's going to be people that are in different situations. What I say is the Lord, if the Lord um, allows you and he blesses you to have a seed, just sow the seed very gently. Mm -hmm. That way it can take root. Um, Even with the churches, a lot of times people will get up here and there's a lot of people that I feel very powerful. Um, I actually have somebody that tagged me and they were talking about this subject and it was very powerful. I feel like the Holy Spirit is powerful enough. The word of God is powerful enough. We don't have to embarrass people and, and do name calling and shaming in order to be able to express the love of God. That's the first thing that we have to do. And so what I want to say is, you know what? Everyone is different. We have to wait for God's appointed time. You sometimes you have to plant the seed and then you move on. Maybe somebody else can come and water it. Because when I was in that situation, I would have people say, oh, so you don't believe in God. And I'm like, what's wrong with them? If we're not doing things in love, what's going to make somebody want to transform or do something differently? We need to be encouraging them and inviting them into the house of God. I actually had a pastor that knew my situation and he never spoke on it. He would give the word of God purely. Mm -hmm. And that's that. That's that. No opinion, no name call. And so here it is, when you begin to learn about the Lord, there's a shift that takes place. When you begin to find yourself in the word, the only um, the only conviction can come from the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing that's going to allow that shift and that break off to take place. So if the Lord is giving you a word and you feel like quit shaming people, talk to them in love, give them the word of God, tell them to read a scripture, allow the Lord to do the work. He's powerful enough. Amen. That was a mouthful. We have Brianna, Brianna Patricia. She said hello to you. Give you a lot of and love. Um, you guys that are on here, if you have any questions for um, Latrice while she's here, do ask your questions and I'll be looking down um, to see what we have for her. Um, and you have a little bit of time. Our time is not up. So what would you like to um, say to the folks out there, those who have been abused, mm. those who are afraid, those who will never come out and say what's going on with them. What do you say to those folks out there? Um, So a lot of times people feel like the only way for them to come out 
to be able to come out of that situation is to be able to go into an office and sit down and talk to a doctor. That's a blessing. God still uses that. But if you're in a situation where you can't do that, such as myself, I never had counseling. The first time I tried um, having counseling was actually this year. What I want to do is encourage you to write it down. Writing was my freedom. Be able to write those things down, make it plain, be able to write. And actually, when you write, be very descriptive. Write about, thank you, Lord, for pulling me out. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for covering me. Thank you, Lord, for protecting me. And then when you write it down, be very precise. Give times, dates, and names. And, and able to be able to not only write it down, but my friend Q always used to say, RIP it. Put it to rest. Take it and rip it up so that way it doesn't hinder you anymore. Be able to see yourself free of those changes. In the book, I actually give a lot of different examples of things that I do because a lot of times we can't move on spiritually because we don't see it happen physically. So when tearing that up, you say, hey, this stronghold is over. Continue to pray and find yourself at his feet. And as you're at his feet, just continue to talk, Lord, I give you doubt. Lord, I give you worry. Lord, I give you the stronghold. I can't get out by myself, Lord, but I trust you to release me from A, B, and C. There's a lot of different people that are struggling, not just from abuse, but different strongholds, different mental, physical, and spiritual cages. And so what I want to just continue to encourage you to do is to see yourself free. Get to a place where when you can talk about it, it no longer harms you, it no longer causes shame. Remember, whatever that trauma is that you're faced with, that could be an address to your past. That doesn't have to be able to speak to you right now. Mm -hmm. So when you said when you when we talk about freedom, we can we what did it look like to go for that first gate to get out? What did it look like for you? What did it take? What was that transformation to even get to that door? Because I know a lot mm. of times the door is open and you mentioned that in your book that the door is Thank open you, and you just need to walk through it. What mm. is it going to take for that person to walk through it? Every step means a lot. So what does that look like getting there? I encourage you to just take it one small bite at a time. Sometimes the hardest thing for us to do is to get up. So sometimes if you feel like you're in a long place, we're so in a rush to just jump up. Sometimes you got to crawl before you can walk. For me, my freedom came in writing. It came in actually um, reading the word of God and believing that he loves me and it pertains to me. But then after a while, he started giving me visions and just being able to go to him and speak, Lord, I don't understand. What is this? Sometimes we're not going to have um, all the correct answers. Sometimes you can feel like the Lord can lead you down a path and then you think, oh my goodness, that's prosperity teaching. A lot of times we have people teaching us that, you know what, as long as you do A, B, and C, you check all the boxes, we can predetermine how this is going to end. But when you begin to grow in him, you understand, hey, your thoughts and your ways are so much higher than mine. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. I have people recently that talk to me and say, hey, you know, I don't really know the Lord. I don't know how to do this. But the one thing I understand is that I can't question him. My thing is, if you can't go to him and ask him about your situation, who can you go to? He's, he's our potter and we're the clay. He designed us. That's the first person you should be going to begin to know that, you know what, I can sit here and I can stare at this situation all day long. I can sit here and I complain about it, but that's not going to allow me to be free. Lord, I trust you. I'm looking above all of those things. I'm looking to the hills from which cometh my help. I believe you've already made me free because that's what the Bible is teaching us. You have to be able not just to try and apply it spiritually. Sometimes you got to apply that word physically to your right now. And when you begin to get into words, you realize he gives you a rhema word to be able to change each and every instance that you're in, to be able to use it to clothe you. We're still covered by the blood. Ask him to show you how you can apply it to every pillar, every post, to every child, to every mindset, to everything that we actually struggle with. Hey, man, you have some more questions here on the board. This is from Brianna. And she said, uh, amen, writing is so therapeutic. 
You inspire me so much to keep writing. What will your next big book be about? What will your next book be about? Um, I actually have two still in the same position, Ellen, two halfway written. Um, and I've been wrestling back and forth against one of, um, one of the books that I have right now. Oh my gosh, it's called This Is Just the Test. Um, and then the subtitle for that book is The Process of Becoming One. Mm. And so the process of becoming one, sometimes you believe it's with a person. But our first process is to become one with him. So here it is. I thought I had the answers. Like the Holy Spirit is leading me to write. But sometimes we don't end in the same way or the fashion that we thought we would. So true. Uh, Liz said, how significant was forgiving your abuser and becoming free? Amen. So once again, when we start talking about that cycle, that cycle in my life was just continuing to be on repeat. I continue to be in destructive relationships. I continue to be in abusive things. Um, and, and that was just probably the area where I found comfort. And so to make a long story short, um, when it came to abuse and offensives, that was almost like my first name. That was something I was still answering to. And so I believe it was in 2015, I actually went out um, with a pastor and I was date raped. And so from there, all the things that the Lord had set me free from became a current struggle. I started getting to the point where I was having panic attacks and all these things. But if you, re if you rewind back, maybe three months prior to it happening, I was sitting in church in the Church of the Living God in Deerfield Beach, where I got my deliverance. And the pastor was up preaching. And then all of a sudden, I just became overwhelmed with this thought in this reality. I have to be able to talk to my uncle. I have to see him. I started reaching out to people to try and have him um, contact me or find out if I could get in contact with him. And every, I had every excuse why that couldn't happen. Nobody was willing to help me. I didn't know why, but I knew I needed to do it. So after this attack happened, and I was to the point where I was having these panic attacks, the Lord blessed me to go back to my hometown. And so I went over my sister Whitney's house and we're sitting there, we're having conversations. I'm apologizing to her for being a hateful, um, a hateful sister um, and just asking her to forgive me. There's freedom in asking for forgiveness. Mm. And so from there, the phone rang and my uncle's daughter, which is my first cousin, called me and I was like, hey, long story short, I need to talk to your dad. Can you give me your, his number? And she told me no. She said, but what I can do is give him a message and have him call you. And he called right away. And at the end of that conversation, um, I asked him if I could meet with him. And he said, yep, I'll meet with you tomorrow, which is the next day, Sunday after church. And so then I had a panic because I haven't had any dealings with this man since I was younger. He was the man that started penetrating me at the age of three. So the Lord blessed me to go back to the very beginning. Mm. So when I confronted him in my mother's house, I was terrified. But then once again, I'm an encourager. I'm a servant. I love serving, helping, and being able to bless other people. So all of a sudden, when I saw him show up with his fiance, the fear went away. My job was to make sure she was comfortable. I didn't know what she knew. I didn't want her to feel like she was under attack. She was unprepared. And so I just began trying to serve her. And so once again, there was something that shifted in the atmosphere. And so um, he started off trying to make jokes. And I was like, nope, I need you to know what you did to me. Mm. And so he was like, well, before you begin, he said, can I say something? So he asked for permission. And he was like, you know what, Latrice? He said, I know everything I did to you. And I do mean everything. And he said, I want to apologize. And I wish that there was some kind of way I could go back and take it all away. He said, but I can't. He said, however, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, he said, I wouldn't have brought my fiance knowing what this conversation was going to be. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, he was like, there would be many children, both male and female, that would have to worry about what I was going to do to them. And he said, at that point, it didn't matter. And so he began to give me his testimony. And right then and there, like the Lord took all of that ugliness, all of the foulness that I was carrying on my shoulders and he removed it. So there's freedom 
and being able to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. There's freedom in asking for forgiveness. There's freedom in actually be, being able to offer someone forgiveness and, and allow them to be able to repent, not just to you, but to first to God. And so in that, it released me from all the bondage. In that, I never had those things happen to me ever again. Wow, just based on, just like um, what the Lord do in the wilderness, he had them to turn around and go back through what they were doing. Thank you, Jesus. And sometimes freedom is going through, but that sounds so hard, Latrice, to go through and stand in the face, not only with um, you and your uncle, but also his fiance at the time, mm. to even think about, like, like you said, unprepared, or he didn't coerce what he wanted to say right so I'm I'm thinking and asking as well do you think that he told her what you were going to say I do believe so and so one of the things that the Holy Spirit just spoke to me is that sometimes we have to allow the Lord to do his work we have to allow the Lord and the Holy Spirit to go out before us sometimes we run into ruin when we keep trying to get out there before him so when I showed up to the battle, the Lord was already there. A Ooh. lot of times, yes, a lot of times, like what we do is we go before the Holy Spirit or we ask the Holy Spirit to cover us as we go in. But what we should be praying about is asking the Holy Spirit to go in and prepare that place that we have to enter. Wow. That is, and a lot of people don't get that opportunity. They just leave it alone, live that life, or they hate, fight. And sometimes the person is is no longer living in the land of the living, as they used to Thank say you, Jesus. back in the day. But you got a chance. Hallelujah. How old were you when you faced your uh, abuser? Okay, so that was in 2015, where, like seven years ago. Wow, that's still kind of like fresh. Yeah, I was about freshman. 37. Wow. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma from, yes, from three years old to 37. Yeah, carrying, carrying that and then the way feeling comes. and living is victimized. So a lot of times people look at heaven and they think, OK, in my afterlife. No, heaven can start right here. We Amen. don't have to wait. Amen. Wow. Well, this has certainly been great. You've been very transparent. We really thank you for being here. Um, hold on. We really thank you for being here and for just being transparent to the world, really. And uh, we just like to thank you. Where can they reach you? Well, um, I encourage anyone, if you're ever visiting um, Macon, come out to New City Church. Um, I'm at the downtown location. I love it. Um, what we do there is completely different than anything you've ever seen. Like when I'm there, I know I'm in the presence of the Lord. Um, you can feel free um, to inbox me at Latrice Marie. Um, and then too, if you have my number, feel free to just reach out. I would love to speak with you. Awesome. And what is next? You said you're going to finish those two books whenever that's possible. And, um, we're looking forward. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. Awesome job, Ellen. You are so welcome. Thank you so much. So this freeze frame it's just it never went is. away. And I said, Thank I'm not you. surprised. Every single time I get on and I'm about to start talking about this book, I'm, I'm about to show the love of Christ and show what he has actually done in my life. This always happens. The last time we recorded, I had the freeze frame. The, you know, it's always something the enemy is always attacking, but he shall not prevail. The word is still going out. Hey, man. Thank you so much. Latrice, again, thank you for being here. And um, good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you once again. Y'all have a blessed night. Bye-bye. And bye-bye. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Our show was with Latrice Marie. Certainly transparent. Certainly a lot of things that transpired and um, very transparent. So uh, thank you guys for all that. I see you, um, Melvina. Thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, you guys will see her pretty soon. I see you, Jacqueline. Thank you guys for being here. Wendy and all of you, Elizabeth. 
Um, again, this is where we have shows on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, next week, uh, not next week, but next this coming Thursday, this is our next chat. And this will be with Nathan Richardson. He didn't write this book, but he always go around and he does a lot of, um, he's an, or, an orator. And so he portrays a lot of Frederick Douglass work. And this is one book that is written by, hopefully you guys can see it, Frederick Douglass daughter, uh, Rosetta Douglass Ferg. And um, she wrote this book and this is paying homage to her mother uh, as she recalled her. So what Nathan is going to do, he's gonna come on the 16th, which is in uh, on this coming Thursday. You're gonna hear a little bit of this book. It's going to uh, commemorate the 183rd anniversary of Frederick Douglass and uh, his wife, Anna Marie Douglass. Anna Murray Douglas, because I know it sounds like I said Marie, Anna Murray Douglas, and he's gonna come on. You guys are gonna see him do some poetry from the 19th century, as well as some of his poetry that he wrote. So again, that will be 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on this coming Thursday. I'll show that book again. It's a very small book. Uh, it's a very, very, uh, about four or $5, I believe, on Amazon. So I will put that link there. And then also we will talk to Tony Lindsay. We will have his book as well. And that will be a vampire story. So we have two more shows coming up. Um, and this is our book of the month that you guys will hear us talk about. Actually, this was last month. And this is A Lineage of Grace. And it is by Francine River. And this book is really good. We're going to talk about it. It's four five women in the Bible, Tamar, Rahab, uh, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. We're going to discuss this live at the end of the month uh, right here on this channel. And you will see that there. Guys, thank you for being here. And uh, if you're following us, continue to follow. Uh, Yes, you put it on there. I see you put a book there. Thank you for putting that there. And we just appreciate you guys. Again, I'm Ellen Sutter of ESP Presents and ESP Book Chat. Stay tuned for Thursday. And I won't give you all at once because I don't want you guys to forget these shows. So this one is coming on on the 16th. See you guys on Thursday. And this is who up next. This is not his book again. It is Nathan Richardson. And he's going to do a portrayal, a poem, a 19th century poem, as well as poems for himself. And this is going to uh, commemorate the 183rd wedding anniversary of Frederick Douglass and his wife, Anna Murray Douglass. Stay tuned. Keep it locked. Again, Ellen Sutter of ESP Presents signing off. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.